Hi and welcome to the first lecture in the Introduction to Game Programming 1DV437 Summer Course at Linnaeus University. My name is Dr. Johan Hagelbeck and I will be your instructor for this course. And for this lecture we will look at some basics in game development. So first we will look at some things about the course. Uh, we will have five theoretical lectures that will be recorded. This one is the first, Game Development Basics. Uh, second is about architectures, then we will go through some math, geometry and collisions. The fourth is about rendering and the final lecture is about animation. You will also have two practical lectures uh, where I show how to use uh, the Unity engine. And the first is to implement the Rollerball project and the second is the Space Shooter project. So the Rollerball project looks like this. Uh, the player controls a ball in the center and the ball will roll around and pick up these animated pickup objects. And the second is a top-down space shooter, uh, arcade-style game where you control this spaceship and the task is to shoot down these asteroids before they destroy the player ship. The examination task is to implement your own game in the Unity 3G engine. Uh, and you decide what type of game you shall develop. So it's up to you. So the first submission task is to write and hand in a game description where you describe the type of game that you're interested in implementing. And the deadline is on the My Moodle course web page. When it is approved, you can start developing the actual game and submit it. Uh, the deadline is in August, see the My Moodle page as well. And you shall also write a one to two page technical description of your game code where you refer to the theories you learn at the lectures. And to receive a pass grade on the course you need to receive a pass grade on all three submissions so we don't have any exam in the course. And to get accepted on the first submission task you shall of course describe a game that is suitable for implementing and that is not too small or too big for the course and you will get feedback from the teaching assistants about uh, the size of it. Uh, so it must be a reasonable size and you will get feedback on the size and also complexity of the idea. So if the teaching assistants think that it's too complex then you can get uh, some feedback. Maybe you can change this or, or do that. And when you have received a pass grade on it, uh, you can start developing the actual game. And to make it easier for you, there is an example game description uh, available at the course page at my Moodle. So you can download it and read it and see what you are expected to write in the game description submission. All three submissions, the game description, the actual game and technical details shall be submitted on the course web page at my Moodle and make sure that you submit in time. So there are three uh, links that you can click to upload. First the game description, then the game and the technical details. So you must upload everything you do at my Moodle and you see the deadline when you click on these links in my Moodle so you know when to submit it. The deadlines are also available in the schedule at time edit. And you also have a project specification and make sure that you read it before you submit anything because that describes all the details you are required to have in all submissions. So make sure that you read the project description and also the example of a game description document. And the final submission is a technical details document where you describe how you design the game code for your game. Things that you can discuss are, for example, what type of architecture you used for the game specific code and why. And we talked about ar architectures in the second lecture. Uh, what design patterns and data structures you used and what problems they solved. Uh, this is what we're going to talk about today. How collisions and geometry was handled and the theory about that is in lecture three. And what type of texture, shaders, materials and lightning that you used, uh, which will be discussed in lecture five and how you handle animations. If you had any, it's not required that you do any animations, but we talk about animations in lecture 5. In other words, you should write a technical description of your game 
and refer to the theory you have learned in the lectures. To communicate with the teachers and other students in the course, we have a Slack forum, so you need to sign up on coursepress.slack.com and join the SAML, the channel 1DV437 slash summer or dash summer NN, where NN is for the year, so join the summer 16 channel. You can also send email to the teachers, but uh, you might have to wait a bit to get some respond and it should be for personal communication so all general questions about the course about unity etc should be submitted to the slack forum that's the main communications channel so make sure that you sign up directly and before you ask any questions about unity or anything else read through the different threads in the channel because probably or most likely someone else have had the same question as you and might have already posted it. So that was it about the course. So we're going to look at start by looking at some basics of game software. So a game system looks like this. We have a hardware and the hardware on the hardware some game engine runs and the game engine uses some game specific code and those two together make up the actual game, Super Mario in this case. And you can also use some tools to aid your development, for example to create graphical assets or make sound. And today we have a wide range of different hardware. We have computers, uh, they can be of different capability. And we have high-end game consoles, the new Xbox One and PlayStation 4. We have low-end game consoles, the old Wii, or mobile phones uh, with different hardware and tablets. And many of these also have different operating systems. Windows, Linux, Mac OS, Android, iOS, Windows Phone. And developing games to support all these is challenging. And to make it easier, a lot of code can be shared between several games. Uh, a good approach is that we don't reinvent the wheel each time we develop a new game, so we make a distinction between the game-specific code and the not game-specific code. So all code that is not game-specific is what makes up our game engine. It could be a graphics engine, physics engine, sound manager, network manager, pathfinding, a lot of things. And many game studios have their own game engine that they use for all games developed at the studio. And there are also several game engines available for free or for licensing, and we will use one which is called Unity. And the game specific code is all code that is unique for a specific game, for example the game logic, the behaviors of our characters, where game objects spawn in the game world. And the game specific code runs on top of the game engine and uses the functionality available in the engine. So the engine must support everything we need in the game specific code to make up our game. And the game specific code rarely have to care about the hardware it is running on. We can write a game in Unity and we can build it for different platforms. And it could also be that we have different interfaces to the game specific code so we can use different programming languages too create the game engine and the game specific code. In the early days of game development the programmers often did everything in a game uh, when we developed games like Tetris for example a long time ago. But today developing a game is a very very large project and we usually have a development team of game designers, level designers, graphical artists, sound engineers, etc. And many in, in the team might have no programming skills. They are not programmers, they are artists in some way. Uh, graphical artists, sound artists. So they need tools to do their jobs. So tools can for example be level editors, animation editors, partial, particle effect editors, sound editors, etc. And when developing a game, a decision has to be made if we shall develop a tool that is specific for a game or specific for a game engine, or if we can use any commercial tools that are available. 
for example, Maya and 3ds Max for creating 3D models, Adobe Photoshop for creating textures, etc., Audacity for creating sound, and so on. And it's all, as I said, it's a waste of time and resources to reinvent the wheel again. So we should try to reuse as much as possible. Game engines are often well, often use well-tested and stable frameworks uh, instead of directly communicating with the hardware. For example, DirectX and OpenGL are frameworks for graphics, Direct Sound and FMOD for sound programming, NVIDIA Physics for physics, etc. So even if we develop our own game engine, we can use some frameworks so we don't have to reinvent everything. So in the course, uh, learning about and developing our own game engine is not possible. That's a very, very large and challenging task. So it's out of scope of a single course. It's a whole study program if you want to do that. It takes years to learn all the theory and practical skills needed to develop your own game engine. So in the course we will therefore focus on the game specific code, the code that makes up a game, and learn some of the theory behind a game engine. So we know how a game engine is built up theoretically, but we don't create our own. And we will learn how to use the very powerful and free game engine Unity 3D. And it's developed rapidly, so it has a lot of functionality. Uh, and you can also create and release games using Unity without having to pay fees, which is a good thing if you want to release something. And there's a lot of useful resources available for Unity. Training videos, forums, documentation, examples, scripts, models, a lot of things you can use. And Unity looks like this. We have some panels in it where we can change things and in the center we have a scene view, all the objects in the game world. Uh, this is the roller ball project where we have the player ball in the center and we have some pickup objects around it and so on. And we have some scripts in the bottom. So first thing theory we're going to learn about is data structures and you've probably learned about data structures before so some things might be uh, just a recap of what you have learned in other courses. And data structures are used a lot in games as practically in all other types of software we develop. A special requirement for games is that they often have a lot of information, content, that needs to be stored in the memory. We have graphical models, we have scripts, logic, and games also often have high performance requirements, especially if it's a real-time game. So therefore we have to be extra careful when choosing a data structure for a particular problem. So we choose one that is suitable and effective for the problem we have to solve. And we will discuss some of the most common data structures that we can use in games and the pros and cons. But first we need to talk about something called memory fragmentation. So the main memory uses a large number of blocks to store information. We have a simple example here, of course, the main memory in a computer have many more blocks than this, but this is an example. And the size and number of blocks depends on the hardware, how much memory you have, and the operating system decides the actual block size in the memory. And when we create an object, it is stored at one or more blocks, depending on how much memory is needed for the object. So we store one object, it takes up two blocks, and it's stored on these positions, as shown in the figure. And we keep filling up the memory with objects, and they are stored at some places in the memory. We rarely have control over where they are placed. The operating system does that for us. And some objects are deleted when they are not needed anymore to free up space, and we might end up with something like this. And now we need to store an object that uses three blocks. And we have eight free blocks, so it should not be a problem. But there is no way we can fit in three blocks in a row. So we fail to create the new three block object because it might require that we have three blocks in a row. 
This is because the memory has been fragmented. The different objects are stored at different places in the memory, so we only have small patches of free space. To solve this, the system needs to move around objects to free up larger blocks, but that is a costly operation to free up memory. And some data structure causes more memory fragmentation than others, which can potentially be a problem, especially if you work on hardware with limited uh, memory sizes. So the first one, and the most common one probably, of the data structures are arrays, and it's usually the first data structure new programmers get in contact with, and everyone that knows about programming knows about arrays. And arrays are attractive because they are simple, they never grow, and they don't fragment the memory. They store all the different elements in the array in a block, a large block, and it's not fragmenting on different places in the memory, in a continuous block. So the element lies in, in an array, lies continuously in the memory, and it also makes traversal very cache-friendly, and the cache is a small, super-fast memory where information that a free printer used can be stored to speed up execution. So it gets much, much faster to get things out of a cache than in the main memory. So arrays are a very good choice if you have limited memory or if dynamic memory allocation is impossible, but we can't make any data structure that change in size. And if we know how many elements we want to store, that's the typical thing we learn when we talk about arrays. They are kind of static. They don't easily grow or reduce in size. And that's, of course, a major weakness of arrays. They have a fixed size. And to make an array grow, we first need to create a new and larger array, then copy all elements from a first array to a new array. And that takes some time. And similar copy problems occur if we need to insert or delete items in the middle of an array. And if we use a program language like C++, we have another major problem. Uh, the software or the compiler will not warn if we try to access elements out of bounds of the array, and this could cause very weird behavior. The software could crash, it could return invalid array, causing very difficult bugs to track down. So, if arrays are not suitable, we have some alternatives uh, that better handle some of these programs. In C++, you can use ESTD vector class. In Java, you can use vector or array list. In C sharp, array list. I think you have a, another alternatives as well. And these data structures hide all the problems of size increase, deletion, insertion that might occur for normal arrays at a small performance loss. But we should be aware that a vector or array list implemented with a basic array, it takes some time to make them grow and to insert and delete items in the middle of the, of the array. And it's usually worth a performance loss to get the extra functionality of these data structures, especially if we don't know the exact size of the array. So we need, if we need an array that can grow in size, then use one of these classes instead of implementing your own. Another alternative is linked lists, and they are very common in game programming because the game worlds naturally have a list of pointers to a lot of things. The game world has a list of game objects that populate the game world. A spaceship has a list of projectiles it has fired. A character has a list of items equipped and a list of items in the inventory and so on. An advantage of list is that it is very fast to add or remove elements because we don't have to copy other elements as is required for arrays. Uh, they have, however, two major drawbacks compared to arrays. They require more memory because we have one or two pointers per element. And the elements are not stored consecutively in the memory, leading to worse cache consistency and leading to more problems with fragmented memory. List can be single linked, each element has a reference to the next element in the list, or double linked, each element has a reference to the previous and the next element in the list. And double linked lists require more memory because we have two pointers instead of one, 
but they are much faster if we need to traverse the list backwards, which we sometimes need to do. And all major programming languages have several optimized versions of linked lists available, so we can use uh, these classes in C Sharp and Java, so there is usually no need to make your own implementations. But we should be aware of the pros and cons of linked lists compared to arrays, for example. We also have a data structure called dictionary. And in games, all objects in the game world usually have an associated unique ID number. So we know that all objects have an ID number and they are unique. So we can select different objects with different ID numbers. And it's very common that we need to get a reference to a specific game object and we only know the ID number of a game object. For example, we need to destroy an asteroid after a collision with a missile. We need to find which enemies are within fire range of our laser guns. We need to send a message to a guard that the guard heard the player, and so on. A dictionary, or sometimes called when it's implementation map, hash map, or hash table, maps a set of keys, the ID numbers, to a set of elements. Could be other things than ID numbers, of course. And accessing a random element based on a key is much faster than if arrays or linked list were used. So it's very, very fast to access an object based on the key. Note, however, that the actual speed gain for accessing objects based on a key is not noticeable for smaller data sets. So we, for around 200 elements or up, it's just as fast as linearly traversing an array or linked list. So I made a test on my computer uh, where I have an array and a dictionary and the sizes of uh, the arrays started from 100 up to 10,000 and I tried to access 100 random elements. And you see that uh, the execution time for a dictionary is almost linear. We have some bumps uh, that occur because things happen in the operating system so sometimes it takes a little bit longer than, than other times. But the time it takes for accessing these elements in an array grows exponentially with the number of elements in the array. So it depends on the size of a data set, which one we should choose. Another thing is a queue, and if we need a data structure where elements are always sorted, a priority is queue is a good choice. So we put elements in the data structure and it's always sorted based on some value, for example, a priority. So an example is that we need to update game objects in a frame, single frame, but we don't have time to update all game objects. We will talk about that more later. Uh, we can then update the ones with the highest priority and then we lower the priority for the object we have updated and the, the next frame we update some other objects. Another example where priority queues are very useful is for pathfinding when we use, for example, a greedy search or A-star algorithms. There are also some other data structures. In games it's quite common that we need to ask spatial queries, queries about room about the x, y and z axis of a game world. What game objects are nearby? What am I seeing in front of me? What am I colliding with? And if we have large game worlds, it's infeasible to traverse all game objects for such queries. And in this case, it's more efficient to store game objects based on their location in the game world or sort them somehow. And this is usually done with hierarchical grids or different types of trees and we will look more into them in the next lecture. It's very common in games that we need flags to determine the internal state of an object. If something is wearable, if it's magical, if it's cursed, if it's poison, if it's a light source or other properties. And a boolean can be either 0 or 1 and therefore in theory only requires one bit of memory. But is this the case in reality? It turns out that it's not. Because most operating systems have a minimum memory 
block size they can address and it varies but one byte or eight bits is quite common but in some cases it can be up to 32 or even 64 bits so storing a single boolean if we have five of them they take up 40 bits if we have a block size of eight or 160 bits if we have a block size of 32 instead of five bits so they take up much more memory than we think they do and if memory usage is a problem because we have limited memory on our hardware we need to store flags more efficiently and this can be done with a technique called bit packing so instead of storing each boolean on their own and waste memory we can store several booleans in a single integer value so instead of doing flag checking with the whole value we can check individual bits in the value because all values can be transformed to a binary representation of zeros and ones so if for example the first bit is set we know that the flag is wearable is set the second bit can represent the flag is magical the third is cursed and so on and the check if a flag is set or not is done using what's called bits masks so let's look at an example so we define the bit marks Masks the is wearable is a hexadecimal value of 0, 0, 0, 1, is magical 0, 0, 0, 2, and so on. So we always double this or make these values. And we can check with a, if flags and is wearable. So we use a single and check. Then we can see if different flags in this flags value is set. So we use an int for all the flags and depending on which bits are set we can check the bits if its wearable bit is set, if its magical bit is set and so on. So it looks like this. Uh, we have a binary representation so we need one piece of binary for each of our flags. So the first flag uses the first bit, the second flag the second bit, and if we convert it from binary to hexadecimal to decimal, we see that these are the values we have to use. 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, 128. So we need to double the decimal values all the time and convert it if we need to. Different binary representations. So how much mem memory do we actually save by using bit packing? If we have 5000 entities and they have 30 flags each, a quite large game, and the memory usage for block size 32 is 5000 instances times 30 flags times 32 bits per flag times 8 bits per byte divided by 1024 because we want it in kilobytes, it equals around 585 kilobytes. And if we use bit packing, then it's much less, it's around 20 kilobytes. Bytes. So it's a quite significant gain if we have problems with memory size. And many programming languages also have a bit field data structure that it's easier to work with than defining own bit masks, so you can use that one. And it's also possible to bit pack our data types. One example is if we wish integers with a smaller range than the standard integer which is often 32 bits ranging from minus 2 to the power of 31 to 2 to the power of 31 minus 1 for signed integers and different for unsigned integers we're starting from zero and this is however rarely needed since most programming languages have other data types that require less memory that we can use so an example from C sharp, we have a signed int and the unsigned int with a 32 bits size and the range is here. And if we need smaller range, we can use the short either signed or unsigned or a byte signed or unsigned. And for comparison, I also found that a bool or which is a boolean called in C sharp uses 8 bits for just storing the true or false, so we know how much bits it takes. And it's also possible to bit pack float values if we assign some bits for the integer part and the other bits for the decimals, called the 16-bit 
fixed point representation is quite common if we work with sound programming, audio programming. And we range between 0 to almost 16, we increment as 0.0024. And bit packing floats was very common in the early days of game programming, since float operations was much slower than integer operations. But it's not needed on most modern hardware, because we have a floating point hardware devices which are very, very fast. So, should you use bit packing or not in your game? In most cases, you don't have to care. Use only if you have several flags in an object with a lot of instances, which can lead to significant reduced memory usage. And if you have problems with memory. Now, the drawback of bit packing is that it's error prone. The compiler cannot do the same safety checks as it can for non packed integer values. So it's a bit more problematic to use. So that was about data structures. The next thing we're gonna talk about is scripting. We have already talked about that we have a game engine and we have a game specific code and both of these are often written in a compiled language such as C++, C Sharp or Java. So we compile the code and compiled code are much faster to run. And, but compiling and building the whole game system can take a considerable amount of time and you also need all the compilers and uh, development editors installed on your computer. And it's quite common that we want game designers that might be less skilled in programming to write some high-level code for the game. So we can instead allow them to write this code by using scripting. And scripting language, languages are often much more simple to use than fully featured compiled languages. Uh, and they're often or almost always interpreted at runtime and therefore does not require any compilation. It's a bit weird in Unity because they say that you use scripts to develop your game specific code but it's actually compiled so it's not what we mean by scripting languages here. And the idea behind scripting is that some game code, for example controlling events, spawning new objects, controlling characters etc. should be developed in a scripting language instead of in the compiled co game code. So game designers can change it. So the behavior of, for example, a character can be changed without having to recompile the whole game system. And also, game designers with limited knowledge in programming can often update existing or write new scripts. As a side benefit, players can modify the game after release, which is often a very appreciated feature. Many players spend a lot of time modding their games to create new behaviors and modules. The probably most important reason for using scripting langui languages is the time elapsed between we make a code change and when we see the results in game. Because we don't have to recompile and uh, rerun the system, it's very fast and easy to update scripts and see the effects. And depending on how the scripting engine works, we might even be able to modify or load scripts while playing the game. So we can tweak the game and behavior of certain characters while playing the game, which is a very powerful tool when we tweak the game to be exactly as we want it. The drawbacks of scripting languages are performance, since they are most often not compiled. Instead, they are interpreted at runtime in the scripting engine. Uh, and this leads to considerably lower performance than if we used compiled game-specific code. Another drawback is tool support, because development in C++, Java, or C Sharp are supported by powerful development tools, such as, for example, Eclipse and Visual Studio. And the tools available for scripting languages are often much more simple. So if, and if we use a non-standard scripting language, the game studio might need to develop their own tool for the scripting language. Error handling is also a problem. Since most scripting languages are interpreted at runtime, you don't have a compiler yelling about errors in the code. Uh, 
but there are usually some tools available for most of a popular scripting language that checks the code for the most obvious errors, but they are not as rigid as a fully fledged compiler. And scripting languages often have limited support for exception handling, and many of them, most of them, are dynamically typed. So variables don't have a specific type and are just variable and the type uh, is checked at runtime and it makes it more difficult to track down bugs typically. And for script to be useful, we must be able to communicate with the game engine. So it requires an extensive interface to the compiled game code and that is not trivial to develop. And if a character script finds out that the best action, for example, is to attack the evil orc with a hammer, the character cannot do that if there are now attack with hammer action or similar actions available in the interface. They cannot do that, what they should do in this situation. Some popular scripting languages, Python, have been around for a long time, released in 1996. It's a fairly good tool support since it's an old language and it supports exception handling and Python is very popular for writing scripts in the operating system or writing simple programming. Uh, a very popular scripting language for games is Lua. It's a lightweight interpreted language, reasonably good tool support. It's not object oriented but supports some object orientation concepts. It's a high performance, a low memory usage and that makes it very popular because games typically we want high performance and low memory requirements. And some game studios might also develop their own scripting language instead of using an existing one. And some famous examples are Quake C, used in the Quake first person shooter engine, NVN script used in the Neverwinter Night RPG series and Unreal script used in the now free to use Unreal Engine. And designing an own, language, an own language is not a trivial task and you should carefully evaluate the existing language before deciding to develop an own language. It's also much more difficult to find developers experienced in a small custom language than it is to find developers that are experienced in, for example, Python or Lua. So the most important question which you should, when choosing which scripting language to use is if you really need one or if you can write all logic in the game specific compiled code. And that's up to the game studio to decide do we actually need scripting for this game. The next part we're going to look into is object orientation. Does in games or object oriented design and you should be fairly familiar with many of the concepts we discuss here. And as for other types of software, object orientation has some very useful concepts for game programming. And it turns out that games map very well to object orientation because a game world is typically made up of a lot of objects and we can perform actions of those objects, we can investigate them pick something up, smash something, open something, and they also have properties that define the size of them and which texture to use, etc. So object-oriented design fit very well to game development and we will look at some common principle and usage of object orientation in game development. So the first thing which you should be familiar with is inheritance. And it's very useful in games since game objects often share some common variables and logic. For example, all enemies can have hit points, attack chance, damage value, armor value, and they can take damage and attack enemies. So if we have an enemy base class taking care of a common logic and variables, we can have subclasses taking care of unique things for each enemy type. So we're going to see one example from a StarCraft AI bot which I have been involved in developing. So in StarCraft we have a lot of different types of units, uh, both mobile and buildings, structures. So we use one base class, which is the base agent that has some 
logic that is common for all types of objects, regardless of if it's a worker, a siege tank, or a command center structure. And we divide it into worker agents because workers have some uh, very specific tasks to do, create buildings and gather resources. We have a structure agent because structures have some common task, for example, creating upgrades. And unit agents because mobile units, all of them can attack enemies and defend positions and move to positions. And in the third level, we have specific agent classes for all types of agents that have some unique logic. For example, siege tank can siege or unsiege. The marines can use stim packs. The refinery can assign workers to uh, gather resources at the refineries and so on. Polymorphism is also very useful, and it means the ability to refer to an object by reference to its base class rather than a reference to the true class. So it makes it possible to have in our example the uh, StarCraft bot uh, one array linked, with, with linked list with base agent references to all units instead of one list for each unit type. So we just have a single list with all game objects. And at each frame, we can simply call the compute actions, or what we call it, method for each base agent object. And it executes the logic for each game unit, so they decide what to do by running their AI code. And most programming language does not allow, for very good reasons, inheritance for multiple, from multiple classes. Uh, it's how possible to do in C++, actually. And even if allowed, we should strive to avoid inheritance from multiple classes because it can cause a lot of unforeseen problems. And one of those is the DOD or diamond of death. If we inherit, the pike inherit from both a pointer weapon and a sharp weapon, and they are in turn inherited from weapon, we inherit twice from the weapon class, which will cause some weird problems for the compiler and the running the system. The drawback of inheritance is that it's easy to be carried away and see inheritance everywhere. You can in fact create a system where every class inherits back to a superclass sim similar to the Yala object class. And overusing inheritance introduces some problems for us. And that is mainly about coupling and tight coupling. And coupling means how much two classes know about and depend on each other. And we should always strive for loose coupling, which means that it's easy to change or replace classes or modules without causing side effects on many other classes. And in tight coupling, classes have many dependencies on each other, and updating or replacing a class can cause unforeseen problems in many other classes. And inheritance is the tightest form of coupling between two classes because the base class know about and is dependent on all public and protected variables and methods. And another fundamental thing in inheritance is that we can override methods. In our example, we can override the compute actions method, which is in the base agent class and in all other classes that inherit from base agent to unit agent. And that method is present in every unit and structure class. And in if we have many levels of inheritance, it can be difficult to see which version of a method that currently is used because the compiler tries to find the most suitable version of the method. And even more difficulties occur if an overridden method does something than calls the parent version of the same method. Uh, so we have an unclear flow of control. We don't really know what's happening. And updating and maintaining such a system can be very difficult. Small updates high up in the hierarchy can affect many subclasses and can have large effects, which we don't really know about. And they are not flexible enough. Consider the following class hierarchy. We have a game entity and we have weapons, which are bow and sword. And we have a moving entity, which can be a player avatar, uh, the character of a player controls, and an AM entity, a character that 
the AI engine with computer controls, which can be an enemy or a non-player character, which we can communicate with. That's what we have. And the task is that we need to make a talking AI-controlled sword. So it should be both inherited from sword, because it's a sword, and from AI entity, uh, because it's an AI-controlled agent. And that introduced a diamond of death where we have multiple inheritance from a game entity class. And we can solve it by using something called component systems. And the component system relies on the composition principle rather than inheritance. The idea is that instead of creating a separate class for each sub-object type, for example a marine agent class, uh, a siege tank class, a refinery class, we create one base class and then we attach components to it and different opponents are attached depending on the type of unit it is. And each component represents some logic or functionality. And changing functionality for an object is then simply done by adding or replacing components. So let's look at the same example. We can have a game entity, name it a sword, we can have a render component that show the graphics for, for it. We can have a collision component or that handles collision, damage component, the sword can damage what it hits, pick up component, we can pick up a sword and a wheel component, we can wheel the sword in our hands. And if we want to make it a talking sword, we can simply add an AA component. So depending on the types of components, that are attached to the game entity, we can create different behaviors. And an interesting property of a component system is that adding or removing components does not require recompilation of the code, if we make it smart or flexible. So we can therefore add or remove components even when the game is running, if we have a system that allows it. And this can be a great help in testing and debugging the game. We can disable or remove components to see which component is causing the bug that we see in the game. And when executing an object in a component system, the object simply calls the execution code in each of its components. So it calls them in order first, the render, the wield, etc. Uh, this, however, has a drawback. The object doesn't know what, what it is. It has no logic of its own. It's, the game entity is just a container for different components. And this makes interaction between objects a bit tricky, since interaction has to be at the component level rather than the game object level. So let's look at an example. Machine gun fire a stream of bullets, and each bullet has a collision component that detects if it hits something. The collision component of a bullet happens to detect a collision with a crate object. And the bullet has a damage component that notifies the crate object about received damage. If the crate object has a health component, it takes care of the damage and maybe the crate is destroyed. If it doesn't, the damage would simply be ignored because the crate is indestructible. It's part of the game world that we cannot destroy. And information is passed as messages to certain types of components at the receiving objects. And this is both good and bad. A good thing and a very important property is that component systems support data-driven composition. And it means that the game entities are not described in the code but rather in separate data files. So it makes it possible to change how game objects work and behave without having to recompile the system. And this is a good example of loose coupling. We have decoupled the code from the data. So we can change which components to use and also properties of different components at runtime or at data files so game designers and level designers can define a lot of things for our game. So we have a sword, great sword of Palayo, and we have a component type weapon and we can define some things for it. The damage is slashing, the damage range it's magical and the range we also have a render component and which graphical mesh to use and a collision component and which collision volume to use, etc. And it's described in an XML file instead of in the source code of the game. Uh, 
so we don't have to recompile the game when we change something about this sword entity. Uh, and we can also create a tool for managing game objects, so uh, the game designers and the level designers can use the tool to create assets for our game. And Unity is built around a component system, so we have different components. We have a mesh filter component, a collider component, a renderer component, a rigid body component, a script component, etc. And we will talk more about those when we talk about unity in the practical lectures. So the drawbacks, we, there are some drawbacks, but they should not keep us away from using component systems because they are very good if we use them uh, where it should be used. But it's important that we are aware of the different drawbacks. First, they can be difficult to debug. If a grain crashes, the debugger can, for example, show you which entity class that caused the crash, but it does not tell you which component was the cause of the crash, or which component caused the crash, but then it might not tell you which game object the component is attached to. And none of these are particularly helpful, and more work is needed to track down the bug, so we gather all information about the bu bug. And it's also more difficult to use breakpoints, since a breakpoint in a component affects all game objects using that component. And the interaction between components is, not, is most easily solved with a message passing system. And this has lower performance than direct method calls. So we need to develop a message passing system. And it can be difficult to keep the code and data in sync if we use a data driven approach. What happens if the code expects a variable but it's missing in the data file? How do we handle this? And finally, the flexibility of component systems can lead to difficulties in seeing how objects interact with other objects. This is especially problematic where we have large systems with many different game objects but easily can have 10 plus components each. So we have a lot of components and a lot of entities and it could be problematic in tracking down bugs. But component systems are especially useful if we know little about the game world. Uh, in a tennis game, for example, we know a lot before implementing the game because the rules of the game and the size of a tennis court will not change because tennis is tennis, it, it doesn't change. And here component systems are less useful. We can hard code a lot of things in the code since it doesn't change. But for an open RPG game or similar, where we have a lot of of enemies and NPCs to interact with, component systems are very useful, especially if we want to add new weapons and new characters to the game. Finally, we'll talk about something about design patterns, which is also an object orientation concept. And design patterns are, as you are most probably already aware of, general solutions to specific problems that often occur in software development. And there are lots and lots of different design patterns described in the literature, but some of them are very useful for game development. We will look at some of these here today. The first one is singleton. In some cases we need exactly one instance of an object, and that instance has to be available from a tipper of other classes and it can be very difficult to pass the reference to all classes that needs it, so instead we can implement this as a singleton. It can, for example, be a file system manager, a resource manager that checks if there are enough resources to construct a building or doing an upgrade, or a message board that which distribute messages between entities. And singletons are very useful, but we should be beware of overusing them, as we should be beware of overusing inheritance. They give us a single instance with global accessibility, and it's not very modular. It can be difficult to understand a maintained code that makes extensive use of singletons. And singletons suffer from the same problem as inheritance. It's easy to find everywhere, and we should carefully, critically ask if we really need a singleton or if we can solve a problem in another way. So we don't overuse singletons. Sometimes we need to create an instance of a class, but we don't know the type at compile time. So for example, 
when we create a new unit in StarCraft, we need to create an agent for that unit, and which unit it is depends on what the player does in the game. Uh, so we have the base agent, and uh, which we should not use because it's an abstract base class, and it, we could instantiate a worker agent or a structure agent, a unit agent, or a siege change agent, etc. So we need to know which of these classes we need to instantiate. So, if we, for example, create a marine unit, we need to create an instance of a marine agent class. Uh, or if we create a unit that has no own class, for example, a firebat, we don't have a firebat agent class here, here we need to create an instance of a unit agent class instead. And this is easily solved by an object factory. So we create the agent instance method, and we send in which type of unit, and it returns a base agent. So it instantiates the correct class depending on the unit type parameter and returns it as a base agent reference. And it's very essential to use an object factory if we use a data-driven composition because we don't know the type until we read and parse the data file. A drawback of the object factory is that it needs to know ahead of time about all object types it can create, and when new object types are added, we must update the object factory class. Observers are also very useful. Uh, objects often need to know when certain things happen in the game, usually called events. And this is very common. The AI, for example, might need to know when new units are created or destroyed, or when a known unit is damaged, or when a known unit detects a new enemy unit. Uh, things happen in the game, events happen. And the observer pattern has two classes, a subject, or sometimes called observable, and one or more observers. And the observers register themselves to a subject and then gets a notification when an event triggers that subject. So we have an interface subject where we can attach different observers and an interface observer, and then we can implement a concrete observer and a concrete subject. So the observer can be our tank agent, and a subject could be that an enemy enters the sight range of a tank. And then the tank gets a notification when a new enemy is shown. The only real problem with the observer pattern is performance. If we have a lots of observers, but each is registered for a lot of subjects, when an event happens very often, and a lot of calls to the update methods are needed. Uh, and if the update method for uh, is needed, we can run into the problem that we cannot update all observers within a single frame. It could be that we need to check in a 3D game if an enemy is visible or not, and that can be a quite costly operation because we need to see if an object covers the enemy and if it's within the sight range of uh, the player, etc. And memory can also be an issue since a lot of pointers to observers are stored, but it's usually less of an issue. If we have events that happen frequently and affects a lot of objects, we can consider using a tighter coupling with direct method calls instead of the observer pattern, pattern to solve this problem. So a good thing is to mix between different patterns. So we can use observer for something, direct method calls for another thing. We can use singletons when needed, object factory when needed. Composite means that we sometimes need to treat a group of objects as a single object. And we can then create a container with a list of reference to all objects and methods to manipulate all objects in the group. And the example from a StarCraft AI bot, once again, we have a base agent and we can have a container with a linked list to the base agent and the AI system can run the AI, which in turn calls the compute actions of all the base agents. And when we have the entire inheritance, so it calls the correct methods in the unit agent class or the marine class or whatever class we use. And another use of composite is we have groups of graphical objects, for example, in-game heads-up display or other types of uh, QE components. 
and to render all objects for game logic simply needs to call a render method in the container class and the container class then renders all the different objects that is attached to it. And it's a very useful pattern with virtually no drawbacks and it's a good way of grouping similar entities together to avoid calling update methods on an object that does not need to be updated. We share the logic so we don't have few classes with very much logic. We share the logic between different uh, groups of objects that have some that are rel related to each other in some way. And there are of course many other design patterns that can be useful in game development. And the one mentioned here in this lecture are probably a few of the most frequently used in game development. But the experienced game developers should be aware of other more specialized patterns as well and of course the pros and cons of each pattern when we should use it. So to summarize today's lecture, in games high performance and low memory usage is usually a fundamental requirement and to become a good game developer you need to have a good knowledge in the programming language use, useful libraries to avoid, avoid reinventing the wheel, pros and cons of different data structures, object orientation design principles and when they are good to use and when they are not good to use, different design patterns, pros and cons of these, and useful tricks for optimizing performance and reducing memory usage. So that's all for today, the first lecture in the course 1DV437, Introduction to Game Development, and my name is Dr. Johan Hagelbeck. Thanks.